Ok. Okay, let's let's start with the second the second talk of this session. This is Sean Taylor giving a presentation about rolling our own persistence. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Taylor. This is my presentation. Uh, I invite everybody to Hello, hello, test. Now we're working. All right, everybody download the slides because they're almost everything's clickable. Louder, louder. Almost everything's clickable uh, on, on the presentation, so I couldn't really fit all the information in, so th you're going to be able to reference everything if you go ahead and download them. I couldn't get the CSS working, so you'll have basically a kind of an outline format, but it'll be, it'll be helpful. So a little, about, little bit about me. Um, I'd like to start off by saying I'm not a database engineer in any way, shape, or form. I, have, I come from an economics background, and... Uh, then they made me talk after Mike Bayer and his really impressive SQL Alchemy project. And this talk is going to be a little bit different. Um, this is not like a real world solution that I'm going to talk about, something that I built. It's, it's more, more of a theoretical, you know, how, how you might think about building a database in Python. Um, so I come from an economics background doing Python, using Python for research. And then I moved into doing web development for the Matrix Group, which is hiring. Uh, we're out, based out of DC. Come see me if you're interested. And uh, I love Python, and I love reinventing the wheel, which is why this talk is inspired by something called CouchDB. And really, the, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about how I would implement CouchDB. And if you're going to implement a database in Python, you're not going to want to implement a SQL database. It's been done, and you've got SQLite embedded. So I'm taking a kind of a Pythonic approach to the database, a documented-oriented database. And to you and me, as Python developers, document means dictionary. Um, for CouchDB, document means JSON document, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, CouchDB was started by Damian Katz, a MySQL engineer, and um, it's now become an Apache Foundation project, and it's basically stores the it's, uh, stores uh, JSON documents in kind of a flat key key value hierarchy and serves them over HTTP. It keeps a revision history of every document, which is kind of neat, and you query it with a MapReduce implementation. Um, and so I was inspired by Sam Ruby wrote a throwaway version of CouchDB called Basura, which just uses some you know standard types in Python and uh, simple JSON, and, and he used Whiskey, and I thought it was really neat. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about. So what's a documented-oriented database? It's just a key-value store. Um, it's a dictionary. So we're storing dictionaries in a dictionary. Um, and it gets a little more complex than that, but not much. So some examples are CouchDB, which we talked about, SimpleDB, which is Amazon's web service kind of version of CouchDB, and 3DB, which is a Facebook project to, uh, to kind of create a documented-oriented database. What are documented-oriented oriented databases good for? They're good for problems where your schema is kind of flexible or hard to, hard to define, something where, you know, writing out the, writing out the tables for your for your uh, for your data model isn't that obvious, or maybe you just want to query it in a different way than using SQL, or you need a little more little more flexibility. So here's an example I came up with, and this is real world actual requirements from my job. Um, it hasn't been implemented in this in the way that I'm about to describe, but this is the problem that we f w that we faced, and we we solved with a relational database. But I th I think document oriented approach would be a little bit better. We have invoices, and invoices have line items. And line items may be split into accounting codes. So if they bought a book, we, want, we may want to book it internally as a little bit to the little bit to accounting code A and a little bit to accounting code B. An invoice has payments, and we have to record the amount paid on each accounting code for each line item. And so we have this giant invoice, line item, payment, allocation group of things. And they're all kind of related, and we end up we ended up having to create a, a bunch of crazy tables for this. And then my boss comes in and says, and we need a change history for all of this because um, for accounting purposes, we need to know what changed at any given time. So now we've got a problem where the, the database schema is incredibly complex. So here's what the document looks like if we were to uh, just put it as a JSON document. And it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, we got a list of payments, and uh, we put some attributes in the payments objects. 
we have some line items. We, we store our allocation as, a, as kind of a dictionary of codes, and we, we record the amount paid on each code. Um, this is a lot simpler looking and a lot more easy to understand than the schema that we came up with. So how are we going to build a database that stores documents like this? Well, first we're going to choose a way to just persist simple string keys and string values, and there are a couple approaches to this that we'll talk about. And then we're going to talk about how we'll serialize the data that we'll store in, in this in the thing that will store the string values. And then once we have that all in place, we're going to add features as middleware. And I think people who work with Whiskey are going to kind of recognize this approach. And uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about MapReduce and how you might query the, the database with MapReduce. And then we're going to talk about just a little bit about how you would serve the database over HTTP. Um, so we're, we're kind of going to build, build CouchDB in a bastardized form. But the key here is the design pattern, not the actual code. So uh, just if you, and if you find bugs in the code, um, it, it has been implemented, but this, the slides are kind of just more example code than what you than than what you know. You wouldn't use it as an implementation. So some warnings up front. As I said before, I'm not a database engineer. This approach hasn't been used in production, and uh, caveat developer. And uh, I, I can tell you up front that we're giving away some of the ACID properties, right? I mean, consistency for one, uh, atomicity is something that we, we may dabble with losing. And, uh, you know, I'm sure some other people could tell you a little bit more about what we're giving up. So there's some cool classes in the standard library called dict mixin and user dict. And we're going to build this whole system using the, the mapping interface. And these, uh, these uh, base classes are going to be exceptionally helpful. First of all, uh, we'll talk about dict mixin, which is an, an excellent way to implement kind of a store for data. Ian Bicking wrote a blog entry on using this to create kind of a file store, and it's, it has some really powerful properties. But the greatest thing about dict mixin is that you only need to implement four methods, and the rest of the mapping interface is, is implemented based on these methods. So it's, it's, kind of, it's an example of a closed set. With these four operations, you have a dictionary interface. So here's an example of how to use it. Here's a file store. Um, we're going to pass in a path, and it's just going to store keys or file names, and values are the data in the file. Um, this, so this, by, de by defining keys, get item, and then on the next slide, set item and delete item, and I'll go back here, uh, we've got a dictionary that will store things in files. Great. Um, and you see we, we raise a key error if the path doesn't exist, just to kind of keep the mapping interface intact. And so. Clearly, this isn't a very robust solution, but you can add file locking, you can add thread locks, and, and you actually get something that's somewhat robust. Other ideas for, for dict mixin, you could, you could uh, map it to some, some RESTful resource and make an HTTP store. You could use Amazon SimpleDB. Um, MemcacheDB is a project I ran, I ran across recently, which will store things kind of in a, using the memcache interface, but store it persistently and not not just kind of transiently, but uh, it doesn't implement the keys thing, so you may have to work around that. And I also thought it would be interesting to do a VCS store, so store in your store right to right to the file and then commit, and then it's in version control. So that can all be done with the dict mixin interface. The standard library also has some options. Um, there are the the star DBM modules, and uh, this is how you basically use them. You'll, you'll import a DBM module, and then you open a file name with a mode, and then you get a mapping object, which works like a dictionary, but will persist the data. Um, so they're a little bit non-standard, so I was going to go through them just briefly. Uh, dumb DBM is written in Python, and it, it's actually the most robust DBM module because it implements the full mapping interface. Um, but it's kind of a fallback option. It, it just it uses about three files to store all your data, and it, it's more of like a journal. Um, and there's the DBM module, which, is, which uses the Unix DBM module, so it's not available on Windows. Um, and it actually removes the items and values methods from the mapping. So that's, that's not good. And then we've got GDBM, which uses the GNU DBM library. And it adds some first key and next key methods and removes items and values. So uh, it's a, a little bit non-standard. And then DBHash, which uses the BSD DB library. It's going to add first, last, next, and previous methods for kind of scrolling through data. Um, one thing you should be aware of is that these, these methods for moving through keys 
aren't going to move through keys in an order that you're used to because it's actually moving them through the way that it has them indexed. So it's not great for keeping data s like sorted in a traditional sense. Um, instead of using these packages, I recommend using a package in the cheese shop called Shove, which implements storage backends for all of the standard library backends, a file store, as well as many others, including storing uh, key value stuff in, in uh, SQL SQL databases like MySQL. So you have lots of options if you use shove. And it, it kind of defines a URI for accessing these, these resources. And it also does all the, all the thread safety stuff that you need with locks. So what are the, the trade-offs we're going to make when we choose a place to store the data? Well, you know, storing it in files is nice because we can edit it. And we have that, that interface to the database. Um, if it's in BSDDB, we can access it from another language like Java or Ruby. and you know that's nice, or you know some some if we stored it in files, we may not be able to store a million documents because the file system would just be crippled by that. So there are all kinds of considerations to make here. Um, I'd also like to mention that using Dick Mixin, you could you could easily partition data across various various data sources or achieve some kind of redundancy using using uh, one of those erasure codes. All right. So here's some benchmarks I came up with, and this is me just pulling out man pages from my uh, from my uh, Ubuntu install, writing them to the store, listing the keys, and then reading them back out. And uh, this is using the shove packages, the, sho the, the shove implementations. So we've got BSDDB performing pretty well, FileDB performing pretty well, and then I, I threw in SQLite because I thought it was interesting that it's it's slower than BSDDB and DBM, and it's not something, I mean, some people might just instinctively open SQLite and say, I'm going to store key values in this because I need some place to persist them. But it's really not the best solution. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, listing keys in the, listing, listing the files in a directory is actually pretty quick. So we've chosen a place to store raw strings and raw, raw strings, but that's not really going to serialize anything. So we can't store Python data types like that. So. What, do we, what options do we have for serialization? Well, there's the standard library, typical options that everyone knows about, pickle and cpickle, marshal, refer and eval. Um, these are good options if you only want to interoperate with Python. And, uh, and marshal is by far the fastest, hundreds of times faster than most serialization um, that we'll talk about later. Uh, refer and eval and marshal are, are also just not safe. So if you're going to interact with some kind of foreign data source, it's not going to be a really a good choice, and I, I've heard, I've heard that pickle also has some safety issues as well. What do we have available in the cheese shop for serialization? We've got tons of JSON implementations: um, simple JSON, C JSON, JSON lib, Dem JSON. Um, we've got a couple YAML implementations, and so XML. There's no there's no real standard for serializing Python data types to XML, but people have written their implementations, and so there are there are some options there in the cheese shop. And uh, well, here's an example of YAML in case I showed the JSON version of the document earlier. I just wanted to give people an idea of what YAML might look like and kind of how readable it is. It's got that, that advantage. And so we're going to make some trade-offs when we choo choose serialization. Um, interoperability is one. Can, can I read the document that I wrote? Can some other language read it? How fast is the serializer? Does it, you know, is it? Is it dog slow like PyAML, or is it really fast like Marshall? And uh, can I edit the document and read it myself? So I, I put together this benchmark, and I apologize for the labels not working so well. Um, and this one, the third one down, is simple JSON, and then Repr, and that's sick YAML. Uh, these are orders of magnitude slower than CPickle. So I, I basically took a huge document and r read and wrote it to these, uh, through the put it through these serializers a bunch of times just to kind of see how fast they were. And you see there's quite, quite a variance up, up to some, something like YAML that's going to be a thousand times slower than CPickle. Um, so, or maybe not, a, somewhere between 100 and 1,000. So don't look at this graph linearly. It's a log graph. Um, there's quite a variance in terms of serialization speed. So. Serialization is a feature. How we're going to add it? We're going to use something called userdict. Userdict is kind of a way to construct a data pipeline. I found it to be pretty interesting and pretty useful, and, and we're going to use it a lot. 
All that happens in userdict is the mapping interface methods pass through to self.data, which is going to be set when, the when userdict is uh, initialized. What this allows us to do is kind of get a crack at the data on the way into the storage and on the way out, um, or before it's deleted or after it's, or after it's deleted. So you can, you can kind of wrap all these, all these calls to get the data. So we're just going to make a JSON serializer into a user dict and load and dump it, get item, set item. It's, it's pretty simple. What other kind of user dicts can we, can we do? Well, let's add data integrity to our, to our data store. Uh, we'll use form and code, which is, which is a great package that can be used to validate uh, raw Python types. So this, this is going to say, make sure that payments is a list of payments, and make sure line items are a list of line items, and make sure that payments have a type and an amount, and make sure line items have an allocation. I didn't define allocation, but you get the idea. We're just, we're creating a schema, and we're, go we're going to enforce it on the way into the, on the, way into the store. So here's a validating dict, which is we're gonna if we were to wrap this around the database that we create, it's going to just apply the validator to the value just to make sure that it passes. And you know we could do something like raise a value error if if it didn't didn't pass validation. Let's say we want to add versioning, which is something that we talked about being in the requirements for the invoice problem. Um, well, we can kind of store something that's different than what we present to the user using a, a, a dictionary that takes out the latest version if you ask for it or gets a, gets a revision optionally. So you can, you can pass in a tuple to, uh, to the get item and get the revision number that you want or just get the latest revision. And version dict is, is going to do something else for us. It's going to detect conflicts. So on the way into the dictionary, we're going to set the revision that we that we're storing, so it's gonna it's just gonna get a unique ID from the UUID package. It's gonna set the revision, and then when you when you check out a revision to work on, you know you may edit it, and then when you try to store it, it's gonna check to see that the thing that you're storing has the same revision as the latest revisions. This is a concept called optimistic locking. It's it's saying that I'm hoping that I can store this because I think it's no one's made a change since I last made a change since I'm since I'm since I checked out this data, and. Uh, this can allow for kind of s a little bit of concurrency, and this is this is actually what CouchDB does: is it it keeps a revision history, and and so if you edit a document after someone has made a change to that document, but before, you yeah, if you check it out, someone makes an edit to it, then you make an edit to it and store it, it's going to raise a conflict error. So that's that's what's going on here. And uh, let's just say we want to add a timestamp. So we want to make sure we know when the dictionary was created. So we'll just, on set item, we will uh, we'll add a timestamp to the, to the document. I, I threw this in because I thought this was fun. What if you want to replicate your database? Well, you can just spawn a thread that, s you know, so very little cost to you in terms of time. It's going to set item on the backup database and, uh, and, and then proceed with the set item. And then... You know, you get the idea. Let's say we want to add compression. It's not very hard to do. How about encryption? Also not very hard. And uh, that would allow your application to, you know, get the key for when at runtime, but then the data is stored in an encrypted format. So if, if, if our invoice was something that was kind of pri had private data in it, this might be an approach we want to use. So let's put it all together with a, a bit of functional programming. We've got a compose function here, which is sadly not in the standard library. And uh, what it's going to do is just kind of, kind of uh, take our types and make them into one super type. So I, I could have put all these, all these uh, user dicks that I'm creating together with multiple inheritance, but instead I'm going to combine them in, in kind of a functional approach because I think it's a little more flexible. So we create a compose all, uh, a compose all function that's going to take a list of types and it's going to put them all together for us. So here's what this looks like. Create a store, and we'll create a backup store, and then we, we use a partial here to say, you know, your validator is this, but don't, don't evaluate yourself yet, and your backup is this, but don't evaluate yourself yet, and then we just, so this, this constructs our data pipeline. It makes it pretty readable, easy to see what you're doing. We're going to validate on the way in, we're going to uh, apply the timestamp, we're going to make sure that it's versioned, then we're going to serialize it. Then we're going to then we're going to replicate it. Then we're going to store it. 
And uh, the order here is incredibly important. So though we were able to construct the functionality, we, the functionality we want in small little bits, the order in which you put them together is something that you would also need to test and make sure it works. But I think that this is a good approach. Uh, an unsolved problem is how to share data across this stack. I haven't really thought about, figured out how to do it without bastardizing the, the dictionary interface. Um, but you may want to do something like that if you want to do something like a transaction or whatever. So you want to query this, this database. Well, you query it the way that you query a dictionary. Uh, you, you could use a list comprehension or a generator expression to kind of scroll through the data. And though this isn't efficient, it's incredibly simple to write and allows you to get a crack at your data. So you could store some reports like this. I mean, it's, it's not, a, not a bad approach. But we could also use MapReduce to query a data set like this. And it, it, was, it was invented by Google to query data that spans thousands and millions of servers. Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's a really nice approach. And in our, in our case, it can be run incrementally if we're willing to store redundant information. So we're already writing our own database. I think that it's, it's you know, we're making some, some compromises here. We're going to store excess data. Why not store a lot of excess data and make sure that we can query really quickly? So to do MapReduce querying, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I'm kind of running out of time. You need a map function. You need to store the intermediate map output, storage of the reduce input, and then a reduce function. And then we're going to store the calculated view. And we're just going to update it whenever we set or delete an item. So here's an example map function. It's going to take the document. It's going to go through the line items and get the, the accounting code that, that we want and then how much how much AR is on it. So this, this is accounts receivable. It's the amount of the line item minus how much has been paid. Or not the amount of the line item, the amount of the accounting code, rather. So this is just going to yield a bunch. This is going to yield a list, of, uh, a list of tuples that are one being the accounting code and the, the second element being the amount of AR. And so here's an example output. We have some invoice ID and then it had a bunch of accounting codes and a bunch of AR on those accounting codes. And uh, this map output, each time a document is set, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be cached. And we could cache that in another database that we construct. You know, we, can, we can make a choice about that later. And then once we have this mapping, mapping output, we can reduce it. So we, first we create our uh, reduce input, which is going to be a key and then a list of values. I'm just using default, default dict here, but you would want to store this persistently. And then we're going to reduce it. So the reduce function is going to take an accounting code and then a list of amounts, and it's just going to sum them. So when we apply all, we apply all this together, we're going to get what we want, which is the report. You know, accounting code one, the sum, of, the sum of AR for that accounting code, accounting code two, sum of AR for that accounting code. Um, if you're interested in this, I, I highly recommend uh, checking out a bunch of resources online, but uh, the original Google paper is great, and uh, Sam Ruby has an example of how to implement MapReduce. It's written in Ruby, but uh, I think you could follow along. Where how? But so MapReduce, this is the procedure of it, but we can also make that into a user dict as well. So the MapReduce view becomes a user dict that just stores data in a bunch of different places for the intermediary output, and then you know, implements a map and reduce method, but so this is, we can, we can use a user dict for this as well. And so our map reduce implementation, we're going to wrap it around the store using a map reduce dict. And what this is, all this is going to do is when we set item, it's going to update the, each view in the view list, in the view dict. And uh, when we get item, we're going to kind of, we're going to make it addressable, make the views addressable. So uh, the, the concept here is, Maybe, you know, we don't want people, we, we, want, we don't want to pollute the dictionary interface. We want the get item, we don't want to add something, get this view. So we're just going to make an address for our views by, if, if we prepend them with underscore view, we'll get, that, we'll get that particular view. So I apologize that the slide is a little bit unclear. So we've got a MapReduce implementation wrapped around our data pipeline and, uh, you know, we can only access it from a Python application. So then we, the next step is creating a server. And I'm, I'm just going to kind of breeze through this because I'm running out of time. Um, it's, a, it's a whiskey interface. It, it, the, the mapping interface for maps really well onto uh, represent, representational state transfer. Um, so when we create this server, it's going to be pretty easy to implement. But we need to think about 
reversing the serialization, how we're going to access the keys, because uh, there, there's no real standard for that. And we also need to worry about content type, and handling e tags would be, would be a nice addition. So here's, here's a sample HTTP dict. I'm going to use user dict again. Uh, we define a get method, which is just going to get otherwise raise uh, you know, a not found page. We'll do a post, post method, which is going to create the user ID, create the ID for the document, and then set it, and then return, return a created code. Or we're going to do a put, which is kind of similar. And I left out delete, but you can imagine what it would do. So we've created a, a data pipeline, a way to query it, a way to serve it. We're still missing a lot. Um, I think that's why I called this roll your own data persistence and not roll your own database, because this is not a full solution. Um, there's tons of things to worry about. And I, I, like I said, I'm not a database engineer, but there, we could parallelize MapReduce, which is another extension we could do. I don't know how well this would do it with concurrency. There's all kinds of worries about consistency and locking, making sure that the indices get updated at the same time that the data, data does, um, keeping the views synced. Trans we can do transactions with Berkeley DB, but how do we do transactions across multiple stores and many other concerns? So I'm not, I'm not trying to pitch this as a full solution. And if, if you're really worried about your data, put it in a relational database. But I think that this approach is pretty cool. So what are the takeaways here? Worse is better. Um, the dictionary interface is plenty to do a database. Choose a simple interface, choose a simple implementation, and you can actually get a lot done. And I highly recommend checking out user dict and dict mixin. They're great classes, and uh, use them like whiskey. They're, they're middleware. You can, you can stack them on top of each other and add a lot of features without a lot of code. And I, I also intended this talk to get people interested in documented-oriented databases. They're, they're a really cool solution. You kind of have to think differently about problems, but it ends up being kind of fun to work with. And uh, documented-oriented storage is kind of cool. So thank you. for the presentation? Sure. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry. S5 is incredibly slow. <laughs> no questions? Yes, they're, they're real about this URL. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. OK. Thanks, everybody.